Hello and welcome to another installment of Plagued by Visions. My name is Juan and yes, I know, it's been a while. <laughs> My apologies. I got busy with life and all of its maladies, but I'm back. And today, in continuing with the ever-present infatuation that I have for unsavory, off-putting, and perturbing subject matter, I thought I would bring you another disturbing tops list. Of course, for the most part, we have covered disturbing books on this channel, but there's been a question that's been asked several times by several different viewers. What about the most disturbing movies that I have ever seen? And I understand the curiosity, of course. I mean, usually film is the first thing that comes to our mind when it comes to disturbing media. I think moving images hold a more powerful spell over the popular consciousness when it comes to experiencing disturbing stuff because we are in awe of what can be captured on camera, you know, what the limits of cinema are, or, or just how much simulation of violence and atrocity we can stomach. And I mean, for some movies, sometimes it's not even a simulation, is it? Yes, we're going to unpack all of that in today's video. But before we dive into all of that, let's first hear a word from our sponsor. Today's video is sponsored by GlassesUSA.com. Now, I need glasses. They are essential to me. They are essential for my reading and for viewing films, which are the core things on this channel. So not having glasses would mean not having the structural pillars upon which the entirety of the content on here rests not to be dramatic or anything. <laughs> the glasses that I already owned were super old, super scratched, and they were in desperate, desperate need of replacement. But I had not purchased new glasses in a long time because braving the outside world is horrifying. And that is why GlassesUSA.com gets an A plus from me in terms of convenience, of easy use, and satisfying results from the comfort of your home and not to mention just how incredible their selection and affordability are. By cutting out the middleman, GlassesUSA.com offers over 10,000 prescription glasses and sunglasses, including in-house brands like Muse and Amelia E, and designer brands like Ray-Ban, Oakley, Gucci, and many more, at up to 70% off retail price. And even with all of this variety, the website makes sure to help you every step of the way in choosing your new glasses in case you're feeling overwhelmed. GlassesUSA.com offers an online quiz, which only takes about a minute to take and suggest the right pair of glasses for you based on your face shape and needs. And they even have a virtual try-on tool, which really helps you find the right pair. I used it to find mine and it was super helpful and super easy to use. All you have to do is take a picture of yourself, put the cross thingies over your eyes and done. You can start trying on glasses. This all means that for me, ordering glasses from GlassesUSA.com was as simple as just clicking around a few times and then boom, didn't even have to get up from my seat. So all of my fellow bookish introverts watching. What else could you want in life? <laughs> shopping at GlassesUSA.com also means a risk-free shopping experience because they include free shipping and returns, as well as a 100% money-back guarantee if you return your glasses within 14 days. Now, the glasses that I'm wearing right now are the Otato Copperfield in black and gold. Uh, these I ordered with blue light blocking lenses, which is another amazing feature. Uh, these lenses are basically for protecting your eyes at home, at work, or outdoors and they include glare prevention and UV block. So wearing these glasses while on my computer where I spend a lot of time reading and editing videos has really, really made the difference. I definitely notice the difference that they make. They make my eyesight feel less fatigued than when I wear my older pairs. So if you spend a lot of time around screens or outdoors, I absolutely recommend them. I also ordered this pair, which is called the Muse Devon in brown and tortoise. And I like these for the sturdiness of the frame. And I use these primarily as my reading glasses because I'm very forgetful. And there's probably a chance that I'll leave them somewhere where I'll accidentally sit on them, which already happened. But look, they're as good as new. So very, very sturdy and very, very comfortable. And I also order the Muse Isaac sunglasses in clear green which are also prescription, and yes, all of the previously mentioned lenses and features are also available for sunglasses. Now, I myself don't use contacts, but in case you do, GlassesUSA.com is the perfect place to stock up and save on contact lenses. Uh, you get 25% of all contact lens brands like Vista Plus, AccuView, Biofinity, and many more. So there you have it. I am incredibly pleased with my new glasses, 
with how easy they were to order and I sincerely highly recommend you try it out for yourself by following the links that I will leave in the description box. So thank you so much to GlassesUSA.com for sponsoring this video and now let's get back to the usual programming. Alright, so yes, disturbing movies. There are many, many of them. And usually when it comes to lists of this kind, we tend to have several usual suspects that get parodied off in every single one. And indeed, there's going to be a couple of films in my own top 10 that are usual picks on every other top 10 disturbing movie list. But yeah, you know what I'm talking about, right? You see top 10 most disturbing movies and then you see a Serbian film, Human Centipede, Cannibal Holocaust, Irreversible, Martyrs, Antichrist, Guinea Pig 2, Flowers of Flesh and Blood, uh, August Underground, Tumbling Doll of Flesh, Aftermath, and whatever other thing people have dug out of the bottom of the barrel, I don't know. Poop the movie. <laughs> Similar list to this one I just rattled off, uh, except for Poop the movie, that one's not real yet. But similar lists to the one I just rattled off have been passed around over and over when it comes to covering this subject matter. And yes, to some extent, I would say I would agree that some of these films are off-putting, but to me, what is truly disturbing about cinema lies beyond what most of these films I just mentioned have to offer. Now, I'm not saying that all those films are bad or shallow or one-dimensional, although in my opinion, some of them certainly are. But what I am saying is, the aspect of them that tends to disturb audiences the most is one that doesn't really get to me. That aspect I'm talking about, of course, is the treatment of violence. You know, the gore effects, the blood, the torture, the poop, the eyeball chewing, etc. <laughs> you know, that doesn't really do much for me. In fact, some of the films I just mentioned, like Guinea Pig 2 and Tumbling Doll of Flesh, I would say almost barely constitute cinema, uh, deliberately so, of course, or at the very least, they are pushing the boundaries of what we consider cinema. They're more visual and transgressive experiments, endurance tests made for no other reason than to shock, disgust, and outrage more sensitive moviegoers. Of course, as someone who has exhaustively defended the plays that transgression, shock value, and distastefulness have within artistic endeavors, I will be the first to declare that such films most certainly have a value, a function, and an importance to them. However, since this is a list of the most disturbing movies that I have seen, I have to say, I viewed most of the previously mentioned films when I was in my teens, and yes, well back then they did incite a certain level of disgust. Over the years their impact on me has mostly dwindled, and they certainly haven't lingered with me the way that my top 10 picks have. Now don't get me wrong, my top 10 will still have plenty of the blood and gore and torture and poopness that you are probably expecting, but to me what makes a film truly disturbing is when it plays with the conventions of cinema in order to deliver a true visual and auditory assault on your senses and emotions. This is what I hope to talk about when I am covering the following films. So without further ado, let's get into the list, which is not in order of disturbingness, but which I will simply go through in alphabetical order, going by their English titles. So up first, at number one, I've chosen 1981's Begotten, an avant-garde film directed by Edmund Elias Merich. At the time of the making of Begotten, Merich was a young theater director who was highly influenced by the teachings of French experimental and transgressive dramatist Antonin Artaud, who was mostly concerned with pushing the boundaries, definitions, and capabilities of the art form of theater and what it could do to convey a story to audiences. Merich realized that Arto's teachings had never really been applied to their fullest capabilities on film, and so armed with that knowledge, he sought out to make Begotten, which opens with a long, uncomfortable sequence, now famous among underground film enthusiasts, of a figure, later dubbed by the closing credits as God killing himself, slowly disemboweling itself while endlessly convulsing, only to then soil itself and out of which emerges a masked female figure. And things remain at the same level of bizarre and abstract throughout. It is purportedly a story of creation as we follow a series of births and then assaults on figures that are symbolic of earth and humanity, 
or something along those lines. What is truly off-putting and what creates a sense of unease throughout the 72 minute film is that there is not a single word of dialogue spoken. The entire soundtrack is composed of the sounds of nature with the occasional eerie synth accompaniment. The look of the film is perhaps its most striking feature as everything has this decayed, damaged film look to it, which was said to have been accomplished by meticulous work of processing the film through an optical printer, a process which allegedly took about 8 to 10 hours for every minute. Of the film. In Mirage's own words, he wanted to create a film that looked not from the early days of cinema, but from the early days of Earth. Something that was captured from the time of Christ, or something from a world no longer our own, with customs and a view of humanity we were never meant to see. And I must say, the task, at least for myself, is thoroughly accomplished. Begotten definitely feels like some kind of otherworldly film, something that pushes at that definition of what cinema and film viewing experiences are. Without dialogue, we are left with a story that is entirely told through the central figure's bodily movements, you know, like there's seizing and gesturing and convulsing, making it an exhaustive and exhausting and uncomfortable meditation on the body and its ability to tell a story. This dedication to a wholly visual language paired with the transgressive imagery of disemboweling and assault and more than a few bodily discharges makes Begotten one of the strangest and most off-putting movies that I've ever sat through. For number two, I've chosen Benny's Video, a 1992 film directed by Michael Haneke. Haneke, an Austrian director, is known by many critics as the master of glaciation within the discipline of film. Somebody whose films are seemingly entirely grounded in reality, but there's something about his camera work and the direction he gives his actors that makes everything feel like a slightly subtly colder and bleaker and more abject depiction of reality. Benny's video is one of his earlier films, and while in my opinion it is not his best, uh, that credit I would give to his adaptation of Alfred Jelinek's The Piano Teacher, it is certainly the one that has made me the most uncomfortable and passionately outraged. And if you're familiar with Hanukkah and his film Funny Games in particular, then you will know all about how this man can make you feel absolutely pissed off and helpless. Benny's video follows Benny, a young boy who is completely detached from reality in the most literal of senses. His obsession with video recording has led him to shun the outside world, perhaps most evidently in how he opts to watch the street outside his home through a TV screen rather than through his own window, as well as his particular obsession with a video he recorded at his parents' farm which depicts the killing of a pig with a bolt pistol, which of course the film not only shows us in its entirety, but shows us Benny replaying the footage and the moment of the pig's death several times in slow motion, showcasing the fixation that he has with recorded violence. This quirky but seemingly harmless obsession is passively enabled by his parents, who later become key disturbing figures of their own by demonstrating how far they will go in their ineptness and lack of parental authority once Ben's obsession proves fatal. Of course, the film was made several years before the advent of social media, and so its lukewarm contemporaneous reception may be due to 1992 critics' inability to conceive Hanukkah's world of total social detachment for the sake of a filtered, muffled, and skewed reality through the lens. But now that this glaciated world of Hanukkahs is pretty much a reality, with social media having consumed most of our lives, the film strikes with an extra level of disturbing, as some of its gestures seem downright prophetic. To me, for the most part, this is a film that heralds in a new era of technology and its new unwieldy language, along with a spell that it cast on the youth, and it is also about people who fail every step of the way at communicating. Everyone in this film, if you look closely, has a very unsettling, inscrutable facial expressions that seem like they want to say something, wanting to express feelings that the slow progression of modernity increasingly has rendered inexpressible. Instead, like Benny, we are left watching through a screen, filtered atrocity and atrophied emotion in a way that, in masterful Hanukkah fashion, leaves us feeling utterly repulsed in the most unnervingly muted way. 
For number three, I've chosen a 1976 Mexican film by director Felipe Casals titled Canoa. A shameful memory. Casals is a director who has opted to make bitter, painful reality his main stylistic choice. In fact, many of his films blend the sensibilities of documentary and fictitious film, blurring the lines between what is fact, what is myth, what is word of mouth, and what is actual footage of a tragedy or crime. If you are from Mexico, you may recognize all of these elements as just symptoms of the lived experience in that nation. Canoa seeks to, uh, I'm not sure, document or disclose, confess, fictionalize, present with rawness, one of those, <laughs> the horrifying events that took place on September 14th, 1968, in a small Mexican village named San Miguel Canoa, where two employees from a nearby university were lynched by locals and three others severely injured after the village's priest incited a riot against them by calling them invading communists, given that tensions with leftist political ideas among the youth were escalating during this time, an escalation which culminated in the 1962 Tlatelolco massacre in Mexico City, which took place two weeks after the incident in Canoa. Casals in this film builds up such an uncomfortable tension as we follow the journey of these five university employees entering a world of ignorance and manipulation that expertly summarizes the entirety of the foul political climate of the time. The anger in this film is palpable, and the indignation and the despair that come from the suffocating political oppression are fully felt as something that closes in on our main characters and refuses to let go. I guess something akin to perhaps deliverance, although in a much more grueling journey given the verite of its presentation. The documentary style filmmaking, as I said previously, presents the entire atrocity as a naturalistic occurrence, and in fact it frames it as a news report at the beginning of the film, and it's that detached clinical eye that Casals has that makes the entire thing so unsettling. However, most of all to me, this film completely blows films like Wicker Man and Midsommar out of the water, making their exploration of horrific cult behavior seem completely irrelevant. In my eyes, Canoa is the most fearsome portrayal of cult mentality, religious zealotry, and the true calamitous force of people's beliefs that has ever been filmed. If you want to view something that truly captures how religion drives people into murderous ideals, and how these beliefs operate in a real world setting by way of political oppression, poverty and ignorance, then Canoa is a true masterpiece in the art of capturing the rot that festers within societies driven by religious beliefs. It is absolutely bone chilling and all the more because, of course, it actually happened. My number four pick for this list is Come and See, a Soviet-era film directed by Elem Klimov and first released in 1985. Like Kanoa, here we have another film based on real-life atrocity, because as we know, fiction often pales in comparison to the hell that is reality. Come and See takes us through the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union during World War II, but unlike Kanoa, the direction here is much less documentary-like and relies more heavily on a subjective gaze and in a set of visuals that I can only describe as highly resembling true madness. That's the first aspect of the film that was striking to me. It has this palette, this cinematographic framing that truly feels beautiful and vibrant at times, and certain scenes feel straight out of a painting, but the visually striking nature of it is used to tell one of the most horrific stories I've ever seen on film, which I guess makes it all the more fearsome and impactful. In this film, we follow the journey of a young boy named Fliora, who is drafted into the Soviet partisan forces, and the film, as the title suggests, invites us or maybe downright dares us to have a look at the entirety of the boy's fall from innocence and deep into the clutches of wartime horrors that slowly wear away at his sanity. I gotta say, Alexei Kravchenko's performance as Fliora in this movie is one of the most brilliant and captivating performances that I've ever seen from any actor. He just packs so much horror and despair and a visual journey in and of itself in his very singular expression and how it drastically changes from the beginning to the end of the film. You can just read all the horror and pain in his thousand yard stare and throughout the film we get so many close-ups of his face that feel truly, truly unsettling and confrontational. 
Now, the sound in the film is another brilliant use of escalation uh, because we start with this sort of vaguely threatening droning noise of German aircrafts that are constantly cutting through the sky. And then we also start with the quietness of Fliore's village at the beginning. And then that heavily contrasts with the sonic hellscape that explodes towards the end when we see the entire process of the destruction of a Soviet village at the hands of the Nazi army. But for all its disturbing legacy, perhaps the most brilliant aspect of the film is that where one would expect to see mounds of bloodied bodies and gore and mutilation extensively and perversely documented, as one expects when we hear of a film that documents the horrors of war, Come and See actually shows very little. It does show violence, but only in brief and suggestive glimpses. The majority of the film is more dedicated to showcasing the internal breakdown of the psyche, the slow disenchantment with humanity that wartime brings as told through striking poetic visuals, and the despairing and faintly hopeful journey of a young boy vying to hold on to his innocence in a world that longs to tear it apart. Intense doesn't even begin to describe this film. Now my number five film for this list is a film by French Argentinian filmmaker Gaspar Noé. Now you think Gaspar Noé, you think disturbing right off the bat, but you most likely think of his 2002 film Irreversible, which I mentioned previously. Well for me personally, Noé has never quite captured perversity, isolation, and moral oblivion quite as powerfully as in his 1998 debut film I Stand Alone. I Stand Alone, which consists heavily of internal monologues and uncomfortable lingering shots, tells the story of a nameless French horse meat butcher who, after a childhood of abuse, encounters even deeper and life-altering misfortune in adulthood as he navigates romance, sexual urges, and parenthood, all the while showing his heavily flawed perception of social and romantic relations. The film really highlights what, in my opinion, is Noé's biggest talent as a filmmaker, which is to inject just enough humanity into monstrous acts to make one lose their grip on their moral cushioning. The blurring of attitudes in this film is what seems to get to me the most. I mean, the butcher is a bigoted, monstrous abuser, but he's also a victim. And he's heartbreakingly pathetic and spiritually bankrupt, and most of his actions are despicable, but they also have a thread of rationale to them that is unignorable, and if the film does anything profoundly, it is to show us just where the origin of human monstrosity is, and how it festers in societal alienation and isolation, and in a world that, at this point in history, became increasingly cruel to its disenfranchised and obsolete populace. The main character's profession as a horse butcher, I think, exemplifies this, because it's a profession that is slowly falling out of style at this point in history, and its brutality no longer is a able to cater to society's tastes and so of course all of that aggression has to be aimed elsewhere and that's where we see the birth of the atrocious acts of abuse that come in small bursts throughout the film there's plenty of gut punches in this movie some of them literal gut punches if you know you know and i think honestly that's the best way i can describe noah's directorial skills sometimes it just feels like he reaches out of the screen and punches you right in the stomach, but the pain is a bit more muted than that. And I guess that makes it worse. His characters exist in this unbearably washed out palette and they're helplessly ensnared in their erratic thoughts and finishing the movie makes you want to jump in the shower and never leave. As far as grime of a physical but also spiritual kind, Noe is the master and this to me is his most morally repulsive and captivating film. So my number six pick is the 2004 drama film, Mysterious Skin, directed by Greg Araki and based on the 1995 novel by Scott Heim, which I have previously reviewed on this channel. This film to me is extremely bizarre, primarily because of how normal it looks, or I don't know how else to describe it. There, there's something, you know, something like Come and See or I Stand Alone, for example, they have that art house flair to them that makes their visuals wholly embody the disturbing subject matter that they cover. But this movie just looks like something that you would catch like on public access TV, <laughs> and that just makes it all the more unsettling to me. The film follows the lives of two teenagers, 
Neil McCormick and Brian Lackey, who lead erratic and detached adolescent lives as a result of the abuse that they have faced as kids at the hands of their little league coach, which they have both grown to cope with in very different but vaguely similar self-destructive ways. Neil has become a street hustler with severe attachment issues and a loose grasp on the reality of his situation as an abuse victim, and Brian has retreated into a world of isolation and UFO obsession. Now returning to my initial point on the look of this film, I have never seen such an honest, straightforward, and unflinching depiction of both child abuse and also its lingering effects as we see here. And this, coupled with how lavishly Hollywood such depictions are filmed, makes for a very uncomfortable but also sobering experience. This is a film that took me quite a few days to finish for, as some faithful viewers of this channel might know. Depictions of child abuse are something I really struggle with in both literature and film. However, the film, to me, never verges on the exploitative, and in fact, it is its stylistic choice that perhaps makes it such an important film for abuse victims. The matter-of-factly approach really takes such horrific and soul-shattering subject matter, but places it under a manageable and normalized light. And of course, I don't mean normalizing the abuse, but normalizing the idea that this abuse exists and dispels it of its myth as this hidden and dark thing and lays it bare. And as painful as seeing this might be, it also feels illuminating. What really carries the disturbing aspect of this film for me is how emotionally resonant it is, with its deeply humanistic portrayals of abuse victims who still retain complexity and faults of their own. I guess it's just an extremely human film, and of course something that is extremely human is bound to be off-putting and hard to stomach. I guess it really exposes a nerve that is seldom seen laid bare, which is of course the nature of very powerful cinema. My number seven pick is the only documentary film on this list, although I would in many ways resist calling it that. Even though it does document a real life scenario, it does so in a style more akin to Mondo filmmaking. I'm talking about Orozco the Embalmer from 2001, a Colombian production directed by Japanese filmmaker Kiyotaka Tsurisaki. The reason I would resist calling this a documentary is because Rather than a thorough documentation and commentary on a real life situation, it feels much more like just a simple glimpse through a window into a common life, without any further adornment except for some terrible background music here and there. It contains all the beats of exploitative sensationalism that plague Mondo films. However, the reason this film left such an impact on me is because, perhaps accidentally or intentionally, Beyond its exploitative filmmaking, I found that a strangely tender and harrowing depiction of urban decay that feels elevated and sincere. The film simply shows us Orozco, who works as an embalmer in the Colombian town of El Cartucho, and the entirety of the film is simply footage of Orozco doing his job, interspersed with footage of the city that he lives in. It just so happens that Orozco's line of work is brutally nightmarish, and he lives and works in the middle of an urban hellscape. Tsurisaki's camera work is some of the most unflinching that I have ever seen. He shows absolutely everything. The cutting open of dead bodies, the draining, the sifting through the guts. Uh, if you're squeamish to real life gore, don't watch this film at all because it starts pretty much within the first minutes and it never stops. The footage taken around the town showcases primarily the high homicide rate that plagues El Cartucho, where the dead bodies of sex workers and homeless people are strewn about the streets and are found by authorities and civilians on the daily. So you would think that the disturbing nature of this film stems from the ogling at real life violence, right? I mean, at first glance, it would seem that this is just the equivalent of a shock video or a faces of death affair. As I said before, you know, things that barely constitute cinema of the kind I've been covering so far. However, at the heart of this film, there's a downright philosophical tension between Orozco, the elderly embalmer who still believes in respect and reverence for the dead as he endlessly labors to provide them with a dignified resting place, and the stark and ever-changing environment around him, an environment where life is constantly eroding, where morale is out the window, and where children are forced to play ball out in the streets mere feet away from dead bodies. It is a brutal film, not for the weak of stomach, but even amongst all the entrails, the blood, the atrocity, and the meticulously documented rot, 
There's a melancholy and wistful tone to the film and to Orozco's life that has lingered with me much more than the footage of dead bodies has. And I consider this a truly powerful and brilliant specimen of cinema. Now my number eight pick is most likely the one that will make people laugh the most. And I myself thought really hard about whether to include it or not. It is certainly not at the same level as all these other movies that I've already mentioned or the two that I've yet to talk about. But in the end, I decided this is a video about the film viewing experiences that have disturbed me the most throughout my life. And so the film at hand certainly did that and it left quite an impact on me. So it deserves a spot on here. This is 2004's The Passion of the Christ, directed by famous actor and anti-Semite Mel Gibson. First of all, if you're wondering what artistic movement such a film belongs to, I have always made the argument that it can be neatly sandwiched within the torture porn streak that horror had during these years, as its release date coincides with its artistic companions Saw and Hostel. Curiously, of the style of violent torture film that I mentioned at the beginning of this video, you know, name dropping movies like Guinea Pig 2 and Tumbling Doll of Flesh, The Passion of the Christ is the one movie out of my top 10 picks that most closely resembles those. It is just two hours of watching dudes beat the ever loving crap out of Jesus, and then it ends. Hideshi Hino, eat your heart out. <laughs> but beyond that, it was the circumstances under which I first watched this film that made it a truly unforgettable and traumatic experience. The Passion of the Christ was released in theaters when I was 11 years old. I was raised in a Mexican household where, of course, the trials and tribulations of Catholicism were inevitable. And so when my parents heard that there was a Jesus movie coming out in theaters, they thought it was imperative that we all go watch it. And so my 11 year old self sat there watching an uncut torture film for two hours and needless to say, Hostel the following year held few terrors in comparison. But more so than this, it was the ecosystem within which I experienced this film that truly haunts me to this day. It was the constant reassurance by parental and church official figures that what I was viewing was not only important, but good and healthy for a child like me. It was the most clear-cut example of the obsessive fixation with pain and guilt that I was raised under. And hearkening back to the comments I made earlier on the film Kanoa, it's a perfect encapsulation of the effects that religious fervor has on people. The cinematic violence that was so often condemned by religious family members was here being applauded and encouraged, and it was all just very confusing and horrific. <laughs> I mean, I distinctly recall having nightmares about a bloodied up Jesus breaking into my bedroom and biting off my fingers, so yeah. Enough said, I guess. All right, now back to more conventional territory for my number nine pick. Uh, this is Pisote, a Brazilian film from 1980 directed by Hector Babenco. This film follows a 10-year-old boy, the titular Pisote, who leads a life of abandonment and crime in the brutal streets of Brazil and is sent to a reformatory school where he meets similar youth who will do anything to survive and stay ahead of their predators and enemies. What Babenko does most strikingly in this film is use the real life environment in which the story is set, complete with a list of characters played by actors who themselves lived and struggled to survive under similar circumstances. In fact, the lead actor who played a pisote, Fernando Ramos da Silva, who was only 13 at the time of filming, not only led a similar life to the one of the fictitious character he played, but also made a tragic end at the age of 19, much like the relentless violence depicted in the film, when he was shot down by police under suspicious circumstances from which foul play was suspected. In the film, although the majority of the actors were underage, they are controversially depicted engaging in sex work and committing crimes and murdering people, with Babenko refusing to leave anything undisclosed or undocumented. The troubled and complicated lives of homeless youth in a cruel and heartless environment are rendered all the more disturbing as Babenko insists on their inherent innocence. The things that Pichote and his friends strive for are simple childlike diversions and every character in the film hangs on to their playful desires which can only be enacted in the most twisted of senses when dealing with so much urban decay and moral danger. Above everything else, there is one aspect of the film that I can't really discuss thoroughly since I want to avoid spoilers because 
I believe that this is a fantastic film that you should experience for yourself if you're interested. But I will just say, this journey of tension between callous criminality and an insistence on innocence escalates throughout the film and culminates in a final scene, in a final image, which is truly one of the most gut-wrenching, soul-shattering, and physically revolting things that I have ever seen on film. This is all aided by Da Silva's performance who, much like the main actor in Come and See, blares affect and tragedy right into the lens, only with his look. You know, he always looks dejected, and there's something jarring in how childlike his features are, but how broken and dirtied up they become. This is one of those films that is disturbing in how bleak, depressing, and utterly hopeless it is. But of course, all of this is coupled with the brutal depiction of life on the streets that leaves nothing to the imagination making it a true disturbing tour de force. Now my 10th and final pick for this list is one that is in everyone's disturbing movies list. Uh, I'm almost utterly convinced that you will find it in every single list of this kind. And I, of course, am no exception because I agree with all of that. And I truly believe, as far as disturbing cinema goes, this is truly deserving of its status as the disturbing movie to watch if you're interested in the subject matter. It is, of course, Pierpaolo Pasolini's 1975 masterpiece, Salo, or The 120 Days of Sodom. Now, what is this, right? Is it art house cinema, an anti-war film, a horror film, erotica, pornography? I guess it's just all of the above and more. It's a concoction of all of that into a space in art and cinema that it truly holds as its own. Salo partially adapts an unfinished novel by the Marquis de Sade, which is a statement that should be enough to have you gagging already. <laughs> it is the story of four wealthy men who, living in the tail end of fascist Italy, decide to sequester themselves and a whole bunch of other ever-nude young men and women in order to act out a four-month ritual-like event of debauchery and atrocity, where the youths will be subjected to absolutely all manner of torture all charged up by the constant monologuing centering around perversity, misanthropy, nihilism, and unbridled chaotic hedonism. There's a variety of different readings that have been made of this film, about its political symbols, the various different allegories that can be read into it, but to me what is most disturbing about Salo is perhaps its perceived pointlessness, its lack of purpose other than to show the capacity of human cruelty. It is certainly not an ugly film in terms of its visual stylings. And what I mean by that, it doesn't have like the garbled muck of something like August Underground or a Serbian film, for instance. I would say in a sense it is beautifully shot, but that does very little to mitigate the true impact that its morally bankrupt subject matter covers. There are many a speculation on what exactly was the point that Pasolini you wanted to get across, whether it was depravity in a pornographic or artistic sense, but to me these questions are irrelevant for a film that speaks for itself louder than any other film ever made. Salo is about torment and is also made to torment, to unease, while devilishly showcasing that nothing in its duration is beyond the realm of human possibility. It remains in my eyes the purest example of transgressive art, because the nudity, torment, and monstrosity remain constant for its entire two hours, and because nothing has ever come close to the level of shock, indignance, outrage, and deep morbid fascination that it has incited. I don't know what I can say about it that hasn't already been said before, uh, but I think it really only bears one single sentiment to lay testament to its legacy. I think you should watch it, and then see if you ever, ever see anything else like it. I myself, I'm still looking. And those are my top 10 most disturbing movies that I have ever seen. Quite a journey, wasn't it? Uh, thank you so much, as always, to my Patreon supporters for all of the help that they provide in keeping this channel going. And thank you so much to you for watching. And please let me know in the comments your own picks for the most disturbing movies that you have ever seen. Uh, do you generally agree with my own picks? Or what else do you find disturbing about the films that I talked about? All of that I want to hear about in the comments. And if you have nothing else to add, uh, just leave a comment with the poop emoji 
in honor of Pasolini's cinematic legacy. <laughs> also, don't forget to check out GlassesUSA.com by following the links that I have left at the top of the description box. And once again, thank you so much to GlassesUSA.com for sponsoring this video. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you're all well. Continue to stay safe. And now please go and wash your eyeballs. You've earned it.